be able to get a scan of yourself, a highly accurate yeah. scan of yourself, that then yeah. you'll be able to just say, hey, put me in a Corvette flying down a desert highway, you know, yeah. <laughs> wearing a red scarf, flying in the wind. Yeah. And there you are, photorealistic you. Workflows is a podcast about saving you time and money in your photography business. I'm your host, Scott Wyden-Kithowitz, a photographer and content creator who struggles with dyslexia, colorblindness, introversion, and anxiety stemming from years of being bullied as a child. Guess what? Workflows have been my rock. I have workflows for every aspect of my life. That's why I am so happy to bring you Workflows, a podcast presented by Imagine. As a company dedicated to saving you time and money in your photography business, it makes sense to enhance and expand the conversation to all things Workflows. Tune in and subscribe to hear stories, strategies, and tools that can be your rock. Hear from people just like you. Get to work with Workflows. Oh man, I am so excited for this episode. This is a one hour and 50 minute conversation that I had with my friend, Frederick Van Johnson from This Week in Photo. If you don't know, Twip, his podcast was actually acquired in his, his community, his website was acquired by SmugMug, who also owns Flickr not long ago. And I sat down with Frederick to talk about the future of photography. This is part one of that episode. I split the episode because it was so long. I split the conversation to two. So they're about 45 minutes each. I hope you you, you tune in, listen to the whole thing, see what Frederick and I had to say about what is coming with the future of photography. Thanks for listening. Let's get right into it. TWIP Workflows Crossover. This is a unique thing that we're doing. Um, it's very exciting, new to both of us, and I can't wait to see where this conversation goes. Frederick, how's it going, man? It's going great. Yeah, I think I think we're onto something here. You know, we're we're crossing the flows. We're <laughs> we're experimenting with yeah. different prompt structures, right? <laughs> that's that's what we're doing with this show. And I think, you know, we're mixing it up a little bit, you know. So, yeah. you know, you're we both have a ton of ideas over yeah. the different topics that we discussed that we're going to cover in mm -hmm. this uh in this episode. And yeah, it makes sense like, you know, we got We've got your your chocolate, my peanut butter. We'll put them together, and we'll see what comes out at the end of the day. Yeah. At the end of the day, the the listeners will benefit because they get to hear a new voice on both of our platforms. Yeah, and you know, and and a mixture of ideas. And just real quick before we we kick it off uh, for the Twip listening audience, just a, a heads up of what this experiment is about. Um, and I know I probably covered this. Future me covered this in the intro for this episode. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to rehash it just in case that guy dropped the ball. But the uh, Scott and I had this, or Scott actually had the idea of doing this sort of collaborative podcast episode. And I agreed. I thought, yeah, what a great idea. How come I didn't think about that? And that's where <laughs> we both get on, talk about the topics that we have outlined, and then, you know, kind of syndicate or publish on both platforms. So, yeah, I'm excited to be here. <laughs> Crossover. Yeah. It's like, Crossover. it's like, uh, Chicago PD meeting Chicago Fire meeting Chicago Med, except it's only two of us. <laughs> there you go. Something like that. I like yeah, chocolate yeah. and peanut butter. That's bad. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it all works. It all works. It all works. Yeah. Um, yeah, you you and I have known each other for quite some time, and yeah. I'm glad, you know, I've been on your show, I think, once or twice. Yeah, um, I think twice. So I can't remember if you were on the last podcast I hosted, but I'm glad that, um, we, you know, we're doing this. And, yes, for all the Workflows listeners, this is a fun thing. Um, if it goes well, hopefully Frederick and I can do more of these. Um, yeah. But this is this is experiment number one, and we'll see what happens. So yeah, yeah. With that, Patient let's zero. let's just yeah yeah let's dive right in. So this this whole conversation that we're about to have is about um, a variety of different things with the future of photography. We're going to touch on AI and a whole bunch of automations and things like that. Um, the first thing I wanted to discuss was the fact that AI has actually been in our cameras for quite some time at this point. Yeah. And, you know, I figured it'd be, it'd be nice to just touch on the different aspects of where AI is in our cameras, whether people realize it or not. Yeah, so, yeah, it's, it's in several areas in there. One of them out there, out there, the most obvious one is autofocus and how autofocus is getting better and better is largely 
uh, attributable to the artificial intelligence or machine learning inside yeah. the camera themselves. And what is that, right? So, yeah, great. <laughs> my my camera has AI in it, but did that, does that mean it's an Android? No, it means it, the, the makers of the camera taught it to recognize certain things and understand those things and weight them yeah. differently in the frame and do things based on that weighting, i.e., oh, yeah. a bird in the sky. Maybe that's what they yeah. want. Versus in the olden days, right? It was other ways that they detected what the what the subject was, whether it be motion or contrast. contrast. Yeah. yeah, yeah, those kind yeah. of things. Now it's it can still do those. I'm sure they're still yeah. using those, but as you know, they're using all of this stuff in concert together to yeah. get that amazing result. Like on the Nikon Z9 and the Z8. Now I'm guessing, mm -hmm. you know, the the, the, the autofocus of those cameras is just you know, kind of heralded of being borderline magic, right? Yeah. The Arthur, Arthur C. Clarke style magic where, yeah. uh, you know, and then cameras like Lumix on the Panasonic side, which is, I'm an owner of both. In fact, I'm on the Lumix camera right now. Um, but back in the day, and Panasonic is, a, is aware of this, one of their Achilles heel weak points has been the focusing on Micro Four Thirds cameras. Mm. So, right, so add a little AI to the sauce and suddenly you get, you know, it's what much photographers <laughs> have been begging for. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, I feel like um, the AI for focusing started with faces, I think was the first. Um, yeah. Recognizing overall faces. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it worked well because as soon as you return the head, you know, your focus would get a little confused if it was face recognition. Um, even that's gotten smarter to still follow the face as the face turns, right? You know, following the, the, the head ra rather than the face. Um, then it moved into to human eyes. It's moved into animal eyes, which is really interesting. Yeah. But then moving beyond faces became object detection. So now, as you said, like birds, um, mm -hmm. uh, full people. So you can detect full people in certain cameras. My favorite, even though I don't shoot this, but I know there's a lot of, uh, at least there's, there's a lot of Imagine users that I know of. And I'm sure there's a lot of Smug Mug users and Flickr users that that are doing this. But like, car racing right so nascar for example there's now cameras that can detect objects yeah. like cars mm -hmm. driving by <laughs> mm -hmm. super fast yeah so yeah. um optic detection and then the the absolute kicker is what uh, i think i don't know if sony's doing it but i know canon and icon are doing it now where it's eyeball focus detection so as you're looking through the evf it can detect where your eye is looking and focus on whatever so instead of you having to you know, hit the autofocus button to focus the camera. It's just focusing on where your eye looks. You know what? That is, is that mind blowing. New? Scott, is that new? Because I remember, I don't, I think it was Canon. I want to say Canon mm -hmm. way back in the day developed something. And I don't know if it was, if it's still in the cameras as I don't shoot Canon, I'm not sure what the, what the platform is like. But it, I remember there was this tech where it would look at your eye. It'd be looking like there's a little tiny emitter in the view in the the eyepiece mm -hmm. that would essentially it was it was kind of i think it was very it was smart and smartly executed but very kind of you know ham-handed because it was <laughs> instead of using you know the intelligent artificial intelligence of like oh i know this is an eye and there's a retina and it's yeah. looking over there and oh yeah. it it's dilated or closed down so it must be looking at this certain distance it's not doing right. all that stuff it's that one was looking at the whites of the eye. Mm -hmm. So if it saw a lot of white in an eye, it knew the eye was probably looking in that direction because right. the retina was, would have to be over there. Therefore, it could use that information and put the focus area in that area of the screen to yeah. give it a kind of a head start on what you're looking at. I'm not, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I know I'm not doing the, the technology justice, but that's kind of a... <laughs> Right, right. I'm a, right. What I, do you remember that? Do you remember that? Feature? I do. That, I do. Yeah. I, I'm sure it was sort of built on that framework. Now yeah. it is what you just described, where it's it pinpointing everything. You know, um, so yeah. like I, like the wedding industry now, it's sped up so many photographers in camera workflow because now it's less less half half touching or less less um, AF on buttons or you know back back, back, um, back button focusing or just um, focus in general. Right, just focus. Yeah, yeah. Focus, focus. Uh, you know, I'm aging myself, but I the first camera <laughs> I owned was well, I didn't even own it. It was an Air Force camera, and the mm -hmm. first camera I was issued was a Nikon F3 manual. Right, mm -hmm. that thing was 
full on manual with the focus yep. prism. Your older view, your older listeners will understand the focus prism <laughs> that you had to get it yep. together, and then your image was. Involved. So you had yep. the the thing was, you know, not to make this a focusing episode, but you the your skill as a photographer had to be such that you could internalize making sure the shot was sharp, i.e. locked in. If it was if it was moving, that was a whole nother bag of worms because you had to yeah. track it and, you know, keep the shutter button down. So it was that along with all the other bits, whether it's composition, exposure, lighting, all that stuff. So all that stuff had to be in play in your head at the moment yeah. of capture. And you fast forward to this glorious future we live in and that part is lifted off of our shoulders. And I don't think... I don't think it makes, you know, people can argue this in the comments or whatever, but I don't think it makes you a better photographer or a worse photographer now that you don't have to worry so much, if at all, about focusing. I think it it makes you, if anything, it lifts the the weight off of your brain to have to worry about it was that shot in focus that I right. thought about the composition and right. I wanted that tree there and I wanted this. And then I had to interact with the subject and get her to get him or her to smile yeah. and do all these things. Now I, I focusing think, is off the table, right? Yeah. I think the word you just said, interacting with the client more yeah. is like the key there because now the less that you have to think about, or like you're thinking about it, but the less you have to like physically, you know, your brain, you, some of your brain power has to be focused on, autofocus, for example, or manual focus, yep. for example, or, or yep. changing your shutter, or changing your aperture, whatever it is, the less brain power you have to give to that means the more brain power you have to connecting and interacting with your, with your client. So yeah, absolutely. Um, so it just gets, us, yeah. it just makes us better. Yeah. And yeah. in, in the other, I think just to, you know, put another nail in that coffin of that particular bullet is, <laughs> the, yeah, yeah. is you know, Apple with their Apple vision pro headset that they just mm -hmm. came out with. So I'm, um, I've never touched that thing. I've probably seen as much as anybody else has seen about it, but it knows where you're looking as well. Cause it's got a yeah. series of cameras and sensors in there that are looking at your Staring eyes. At you. so that, yeah. So it can do all <laughs> sorts of things like what, yeah. what, should, what are they looking at? What should be in focus, which not yeah. be in focus, you know, how much processor speed should yeah. I apply to that part of the screen versus where they're not looking. All yeah. that stuff is happening. I gotta imagine those sorts of technologies, much like, I don't know, like when when smartphones launched, right? When when and sort of started pro proliferating around the planet and became the norm, mm -hmm. other industries popped up because of smartphones and other technologies, like the miniature miniaturization of compasses to go in the devices, the accelerometer, the you know altitude sensor, all those things went yeah. in miniaturized on a chip into this device to make that device possible. This yeah. new device, the Apple Vision Pro, has other technologies in there that I got to imagine are going to find their way into other industries, yes. some existing, some that we don't even know about yet are going to show yeah. up because of what Apple and their trillions of dollars are developing into this this kind of new platform. So Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I, not to get too sidetracked on like outside of photography, but like imagine mm -hmm. that technology that's in the these, you know, VR goggles. <laughs> That's what, cause that's yeah. what I'm going to call them. Um, they are. You know, yeah. Imagine that they're now in your car and you look off the road and now your car is yelling at you for looking off the road. Yeah. Like, well, cars do that now. So, they do that now. They, they have that built into the Teslas and, and many of the electric. So when they're self-driving in there, right? So uh, yeah, 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 true, true. Yeah. Yeah. They make so, sure that you're, you're paying attention to the road, which I don't like. I don't, it's one thing to have that in my camera <laughs> and to assist me with making a better photo. When What's your life's on the line. That, <laughs> yeah. And I have a, well, yeah, I mean, I know it's for safety and everything, but I just yeah. I feel weird when I feel like okay, someone's watching me, you yeah. know, and I'm driving, even if it's an it's an an entity, an AI, or my yeah. car, or whatever, for my own good. Yeah. It's like it feels a little invasive. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I don't mind the car looking at the road for me, but I don't want it looking yeah. at me. Don't look at me. You don't look at me. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. So, so you, moving on, when to the you next... doze off and hit somebody, then you're like, okay, well, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Damn you, car! <laughs> um, so, so there's a bunch of other new, newer AI techs that tech te technology that's making its way into apps. Some of again have existed for some time. Um, that I think are um, for for one example being something very beneficial to stock photographers, commercial photographers, landscape photographers. Some cases potentially wedding photographers could utilize this. Um, but there's Xire Photo. 
XR Search, XR Photo, like this company mm -hmm. who makes it detect it scans your 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 photos. The XR Search is a Lightroom plugin. XR Photo is a standalone app, and they um they it basically looks at your photos, analyzes what the photo is, and creates keywords for you on a variety of factors. And on one just came out with theirs on well we're recording this on June twenty first. It's a Wednesday. On Monday, what was it? The nineteenth, I guess. Um, on one came out with their own version of that, which is a standalone app. There's no Lightroom plugin, at least right now. And uh, it also does the same thing. You know, it just scans your photos for keywords and adds the photos to the metadata. You can then load it up in Lightroom, and now you've got all those keywords in Lightroom or in yeah. Photoshop or wherever. Um, and I feel like that's I've – used, I've used both at this point. Um, I've only used on ones for a couple of days at this point, but it's a – it's amazing. As as somebody who loves landscape photography, I find it amazing how accurate and interesting the keywords can come up with. So, yeah. what are your thoughts yeah. on on those? I I agree. Yeah, I'm very. I, I know the folks over at Exire. You know, from the top on down, the great folks mm -hmm. that are that are you know genuine folks that are working on genuine software that solves a genuine. I, I don't know if you want to call it a problem, but a an annoyance to photographers, yes, right? An annoyance and that's that for whole sure. Keyword. Yeah, and yeah. it's my annoyance with keywording comes in when I see friends of mine, like I don't know, Photo Joseph or somebody like that, who's all in and meticulous on their keywording and the hierarchies and all that stuff, and everything's perfect. He could find he could find the hair on a dog from nineteen, <laughs> you know, <laughs> whatever, you know, and yeah. um, but. <laughs> Yeah, so in step a company like Exire and now on one with these, you know, a way to use artificial intelligence. In this case, you know, AI is AI is a weird term, right? Because it's it's yeah. thrown around a lot. Yeah. It covers a whole bunch of things, but everyone thinks it's only one thing. In the case of this, what they're doing with the keywording is again, it's back down to machine learning, i.e., yeah. brute force, feed the machine a bunch of photos so that it knows what's what. And then when it sees something that looks like that, apply that tag to it. That's yeah. all it's doing. So if it sees a red, a red dog or a, red, a cat or something, mm -hmm. it's gonna go, oh, that is a cat. Okay. Yeah. And here's the tree for cat: feline, yeah. claws, yeah. blah. You know. So it's gonna yeah. put all that stuff in there for you automatically, well beyond anything that you or I would ever feel like or want to do as a human. We can through this kind of menial grunt work over to the AI and have it do it more Definitely. efficiently than we could ever conceive of doing. And that, yeah. that's, that's what it's for. I mean, it's brilliant. I did a whole tutorial for the Exire folks. I think mm -hmm. they may still have it on their site where and I kind of walked through the software and demoed all the different pieces of how, how it works and how it can fit in. Yeah. And it's magical, man. It, it, is, yeah. it is really magical just to be able to see and you know, if you've been shooting for as long as I have, you probably have a library full of images, oh, yeah. whether they're personal or, you know, kids and or yeah. work or whatever. But to be able to, with the power of a piece of software, after it indexes everything, to go in and say, yeah, show me every photo from when I went to yeah. Las Vegas. Boom. Yep. Okay, show well, me I, every photo from yeah. when I went to the MGM Grand or every photo yeah. that has, you yeah. know, it's, yeah, it's, it's very, yeah, a very real world, A real world example of how I use Xire while working at Imagine, actually. So I've been at Imagine now for uh, we're approaching two years already, and um, and it was a um, this la almost a year ago, in a couple weeks. So it was, um, we were coming up to July Fourth to Independence Day here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And our social media manager was like, "Hey, does anybody have fireworks photos?" I was like, "I do." So I loaded up Lightroom, and I, you know I was using um, XR Search, and I just literally just searched for the word fireworks, and I exported every photo that I've ever shot of fireworks ever into a, you know, bunch of JPEG for him to choose from. It took me two seconds and it was, you know, only due to having all my, key my keywords in place thanks to XR search. So real yeah. world, like, yeah, I had a need and it solved it. <laughs> so. Yeah. That's why, you know, when people complain about, oh, AI is going to take our jobs and blah, 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 blah. I'd yeah, uh, yeah. Some jobs, absolutely. It's gonna, it's gonna eat them and spit them out. You know, yeah. that we could see it already. You know, so I'd be, I'd be terrified if I were in some industries that are going to be affected by this. You know, whether it be people that write stuff, or you know, even <laughs> you know, as we see things sort of unfold, even 
you know, in the future, I, I predict we're going to see certain industries, like even maybe headshot photography taking a hit because at a certain point, you're going to be able to get a scan of yourself, a highly accurate yeah. scan of yourself that then yeah. you'll be able to just say, hey, put me in a Corvette flying down a desert highway, you know, yeah. <laughs> wearing a red scarf, flying in the wind. Yeah. And there you are, photorealistic you. So there's these things. Yeah. I, I feel like the, those kind of jobs or those kind of tasks are in the crosshairs of this AI stuff. But then there's the other things also that get painted with the same AI brush, like keywording, and then these more more mundane things that we yeah. are like, oh, thank you, AI, for doing yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Or exactly. I'm a, I'm a Grammarly-holic. You know, the app Grammarly? Same. I, <laughs> I use it to appear more intelligent than I am every day. <laughs> <laughs> Un, yeah, and I'm not embarrassed to say that every day I use it. It's great. Right, it's right now we have uh, Grammarly is in, is a uh, in, in uh, attached to Frederick's brain, and right now we're hearing the intelligent Frederick. But once we remove that chip, he goes back to the. <laughs> you know, it's low key. It is low key, Mrs. Mitchell. Mrs. Mitchell was <laughs> was uh, my English one of my English teachers in high school, uh, and I remember. The, yeah. I, I she would correct me on certain grammar mistakes all the time. Like, oh, mm. when you do a quotation mark the and you're quoting at the end of a sentence, the period needs to be inside the quotation mark, not outside, even though it looks yep. like it should, you know, things like that, or this should be hyphenated, or that should be, or yeah. even the dreaded, where does the apostrophe go? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, especially when their name ends in S and you're talking about something that's not, you know. So those yeah. kind of things that trip up people. Grammarly catches those for yeah. me, and over time, if it catches them enough, you know, I'm like, oh, I, I don't make the mistake anymore. So I don't make the mistake of putting the period outside of the quotation mark anymore because Grammarly has hit me over the head so many times. It's yeah. now, you know, I do it right. So I, I would argue that I'm smarter or at least better grammatically than I was a year ago because of using this software and the, or using yeah. these tools like, like Grammarly. So it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, totally, totally. Um, you brought up the headshot thing. We're gonna get back. We're gonna get to generative imaging. Do you want to talk about yeah. that now and go back to the other the, to the other two topics, or do you want to yeah, wait and come not? back to? All right. So, so, so generative imaging, right? Generative AI images, as mm -hmm. officially termed or whatever. I don't know. Um, I am. I have a love hate relationship with these. I can find them to be useful. The whole headshot thing. Like, there's a website that exists. I tried it. You pay twenty bucks or whatever. You upload. 20 or however, four, 20 to 50 something photos of yourself. Mm -hmm. And then it literally creates headshots for you. Yeah. Linza. Linza.ai is the, I think that's one of the tools the, that does that. Yeah. That's one of the tools. There's actually one dedicated to just headshots. Oh, is and, it? Oh, yeah. Oh, I need to know the name of that. I'm going to try it. Yeah. I'll, I'll look it up when we're, when we're done. But it's, um, it, it does a, a decent job. I mean, it still doesn't look real. Um, some of them don't even look like you, but it does a decent yeah. job. In fact, sh at Shutterfest, um, you know, like at, you know, you go to a trade show, you go to WPPI, you go to imaging, whatever. There's always banners of the speakers and of the of the sponsors and stuff like that. Yeah. At Shutterfest on the trade show floor, they had um, banners, and this year, all the banners were of the speakers as AI, and oh, it wow. was the talk of the show because. Nine times out of ten, it didn't look like the speaker at all. Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah. So it's interesting. Maybe it looked like um, what the speaker wished they looked like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you know, I, I've played around with a lot of the the uh, ge uh, generative AI imaging tools, and I've seen I've seen workflows like Sam Hurd, for example, just put out a, a YouTube video showing how he's automating going from his Canon camera to Dropbox. Or to a, to his FTP server, and then Midjourney's taking it, taking that and creating four potential variations on the photo and putting in a Dropbox folder and within like a minute, all in real time, and so it gives him to be able to like shoot with a client and then see a variation of what maybe he can try something else, you know? Yeah. And yeah. so I there's there's potential really cool uses for it. I'm not a fan of just the create this image. And it outputs it, right? Um, I, yeah. I, I do like the whole Photoshop thing where it's like expand the scene, let it take your photo and some AI and, and fill in. But um, yeah. yeah, there's so much, there's so much to unpack there. And thank <laughs> you know. for bringing that. 
Thank you for bringing it up. Like I said, I, like I told you before, I just got back from uh, Infocom in Orlando. Mm -hmm. I was doing, I did a couple of, I sat on a panel that was talking about the future of streaming and how AI might, might affect that. And then I did a talk on uh, how, you, you know, basically it was my workflow and, and different ways that I'm using AI to enhance my workflow that I wasn't doing a year or so ago. But, you know, it's the, on the generative side of things, it is, it, it, it like I said in the talk, it's, it's, I'm cautiously optimistic, but I, I lean more towards optimistic on yeah. where this stuff is taking us I, and heavily more towards optimistic, um, but with a healthy dose of pessimism and fear, right? To keep us, <laughs> to keep us alive, right? Fear, but, fear. Yeah. Fear. Yeah. But. You know, the, when I when I look at this stuff, especially the generative stuff, I can't help but be excited to go back a little bit to your to your your thoughts about just sort of headshot photography not being there yet, where, you know, people upload a series of images and it does the yeah. thing. We're in pre alpha, I think, for yeah. this stuff. Right. Yeah. You we literally a lot of people don't. We're at the point now, like right now, you'd be hard pressed to find a person on the planet that doesn't know what an iPhone is. Right. Mm -hmm. It wasn't always that way. Right. It was right. at a certain point, there were just a certain group of people, insiders that, you know, that knew about it or knew it was coming or whatever. Even after all of Apple's launch plans or whatever, there's a certain contingent of the population on the planet are like, what? What's a, what's an iPhone? And now, of course, everybody knows we've been marinating in it for years now. So everyone knows what their iPhone is. And it has advanced to the point where these things, our phones are doing things that were, we never conceived that they would go, right? They've birthed billion dollar industries that we had no idea we needed 10, 15 years ago, like Uber and Lyft and those kinds of things. So yeah. I look at AI, especially on the generative side of things, as being kind of that we're at, the, we're at launch at the beginning of all this. So you extrapolate out 10, 15 years or so, what that's where photographers I think need to be looking like kind of skating to where the puck is going to be so if you look at where this stuff is pointing to right now with what meta is trying to do what apple is trying to do you kind of zoom out a little bit and look at what hap what's happening with crypto and nft and how that's going to work into this and mid journey and photoshop with firefly and how that's going to work into this new kind of these many worlds that are are being built. Look at what NVIDIA is doing mm -hmm. with their hardware. You know, it's hard to think of a of a scenario when super realistic, uh, unreal engine quality avatars of our our persons are not going to be one of the next kind of Uber or Holy Grail companies. Where it's like, okay, yeah, you can. Instead, right now, it's like, okay, s upload a bunch of photos, 2D crappy photos of yourself, and the AI will do some interesting tricks with it, right? That's kind of where we are now. But imagine mm -hmm. the world where you can go to a facility somewhere, I don't know, maybe it's a photo studio of the future, and get a full-on perfect scan of your entire body as it stands right now. You know, of course, you'll be able to make modifications to it, you know, if you don't like the way you look or whatever, but you'll have that data at a super high resolution, uh, you know, on a super high resolution scan that then you can do other things with. Like I said, you know, put yourself in different situations, show up in Zoom calls, uh, render a headshot for whatever. Will headshots even be necessary if somebody can just call up your your virtual profile on LinkedIn of the future? So, yep. you know, it's it, it's those things. When I look at these technologies, Adobe and, and their... their forward thinking to put generative AI as a tool within Photoshop to give us a taste yep. of what brilliant. can happen. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> yep. And it's scaring, it's scaring the crap out of a ton of people, I think, because yeah. rightly yeah. so headshot photographers, commercial photographers, like in that, that same yeah. ilk, right, Scott? So the same ilk of, okay, I can go to a facility and get myself scanned in. Now I can put myself in whatever situation. I don't have to mm. worry about going to get a photo shoot. All my family's been scanned too. So I could do a Christmas photo, you know, that's that's appropriate for the time and we're all in Christmas suits. I could generate that if I want to. Now, of course, yeah, you probably want to just shoot that because it's personal, but you could generate that. I think about it from the impact on commercial photography, though. So mm -hmm. what happens when company A decides, hey, we have this widget 
that we need a bunch of photos for for the website right and they yeah. just get that widget scanned in much like yep. car companies are doing today they just yep. scan they have forward 3d representations of their cars they can do whatever the heck they want to do with well, imagine when that's the whole world can do that yeah. with anything right anything. so yep. yeah it changes it changes a lot yeah it's it's it is it's it is definitely um a little bit of caution but a little <laughs> a little bit of fear but a whole lot of optimism yeah. It's a definitely mixed emotions when it comes to generative, generative AI, but I, I am a hundred percent agreement with you. I think what, what Adobe has done so far, um, it's the natural progression of here's what people are doing to manipulate photos already. Let's give them this AI to just take it to the next level and make it easy instead of having to go to mid journey and do this to then go back to here then go back to here, just have it in yeah. one place and have it easy, um, throughout the, throughout the software. Um, I think there's still, it's definitely a way to go. I still think like, yes, it's beta, but it's definitely still alpha. Um, yeah. there's a way to go. Uh, I've did, I did, I put out a video a few weeks back. Uh, it's the, the good, the bad, and the ugly with, with Photoshop's generative AI that's built in. Mm. And mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. showed, I showed what it did great and what it didn't do so great. Um, yeah. like when I asked it to replace a sock with a bird and it made a sock bird puppet. <laughs> and I was like. Not really what I asked it to do. It's funny, but it's not. Maybe it has funny. a sense of humor. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, maybe it does. But um, yeah. So let's let's go to something a little more, um, less less scary in in some cases. Very very productive, very workflow oriented, and yeah. actually happening now, which is yeah. cool. Um, camera to cloud. Yeah. So this is something. That is um, being pioneered and spearheaded by um, Fuji, Fuji Film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Imagine Smug Mug. Um, who else is in on Skyloom is in on this. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, Frame.io, which is Adobe, they're yeah. in on this. So this is something that was uh, demoed lightly at Imaging USA. And by lightly, I mean informal, but they still put on a presence. Um, and then more heavily demoed at WPPI. Yeah. And it was so cool. So the concept is, um, and even though it's a proof of concept, it's, it's happening. Like, this mm -hmm. is happening. Um, and again, it started with Fujifilm. There's a good chance, very good chance, that a lot of cameras like Panasonic and Nikon and Canon will be doing stuff like this. But you shoot in camera with, right now, the Fujifilm cameras. Two of them that do this. Yeah. The cat, the photos go directly to Frame.io, as well as the memory card. So you got it in, in both places. You got your raw file on the memory card. You got a raw file that went to Frame.io directly. No phone needed in between. It is then cold and edited by Imagine's AI. Right. So right now it's being edited by Imagine. Calling can happen in the future just by flipping a switch. Right. Um, but it's editing, it's being edited by Imagine, again, through the cloud. And then it's being sent to a SmugMug Mug gallery. My, my favorite part, the raw file sent to SmugMug Mug with the XMP of the edits sent to SmugMug Mug and the outputted JPEG sent yeah. to SmugMug Mug in a SmugMug Mug gallery ready for your client to see and order prints from. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. It feels like that's the holy grail, right? For me, it feels like that is the holy grail that that a lot of photographers in a lot of different industries have been chasing for a while. Photojournalists, yeah. for example, and sports yeah. photographers. Like you're you're at the game, you know. In the olden yeah. days, well, the olden olden days, you were shooting film, so there was that gap, right? And then when it went digital, it was the gap of the time that you can get over to some place to go through your images and upload them to AP or wherever, you know, mm -hmm. then you, and now with this camera to cloud piece, we're kind of removing that last bit out of there as well, yeah. which I think, which, which is a, a couple of topics to touch on there. The first one is, yeah, the convenience and the, mm -hmm. the, the way that I feel like they're designing it, the technology to work. And yeah, you know, for folks that don't know, just, just to set the stage here, my company, This Week in Photo, the podcast, the educational resource, et cetera, community, was acquired last year in 2022 by SmugMug to 
go along with Flickr and Smug Mug as one of the three brands over there. So uh, I had a heads up that this was coming, right? The whole Fuji and uh, camera to cloud partnership between those, you know, between Smug Mug and Fuji. And, you know, I look at this and I think, okay, at its core, this, when I first saw it, I was like, okay, at its core, we're, we're replacing that long tether tools cable that I yeah. have, you know, when I'm shooting tethered and I got somebody in the studio and I shoot it and they can see it yeah. on the screen and, oh yeah, that's good. Yeah, but maybe try yeah. not this much, whatever. So you, that, that's the flow I was thinking. So that bandwidth of shoot, squeezing that JPEG, that XMP sidecar file, that raw file, all the data yeah. is in the case of tether tools is going through that cable, that orange cable to your computer. In the case of this, it's going to the orange cloud. cable, by the way. I love my orange cables. Yeah, I had to throw one away yesterday because oh, it was old. It was an old connector. Uh, um, but the yeah, but instead it's going to the cloud and then mm -hmm. coming down to wherever based on w rules or where you want it to go. Like you yeah. go to a smug mug gallery that has certain permissions and access yeah. privileges set on it already. Right. You know, for me personally, that's scary because I don't. For yeah, I want it to go up there for me, but um, very rarely are my shots ready for human consumption you know, right out of camera. I need to do a little, right. I need to put some Frederick seasoning on them before other humans see them. So there's that, but if you're doing photojournalism, you're on the field somewhere and news needs to happen yeah. right now, boom, and it's on the editor's desk and they can make yeah. the decision on what, what goes where. I think it's brilliant, but you know, this isn't, this, unless I'm missing something, this isn't necessarily brand new technology. The, I think the tech is new, what they're building. I have no idea what magic they put in the software and hardware to make this work. But you remember back in the day, there was a company called iFi. You remember yeah. iFi? Yep, the memory yeah, card did the, did the work. Memory card. Yeah. They had Wi-Fi. They had squeezed a Wi-Fi yeah. transmitter uh, onto yeah. a little SD card that you'd stick yeah. in your camera, and it would do something similar. You'd shoot. Yeah. It re would record to the chip, to the memory of the card, but then yeah. also go to iFi servers, which mm -hmm. would then, based on your rules, syndicate that image out to different areas the jpeg yeah. of course right yes but it, you could have it go to Flickr. you could have it go to smug yep. mug you could have it go to wherever you know yeah. all these different places at the point of capture but it was yep. buggy and it was slow yes and it was jpeg yep. only and it was slow yeah. and it was slow <laughs> yeah so yeah i think it didn't I think work the magic, it didn't work i think that yeah i think the magic of what fujifilm has done is they built it with i believe it's wi-fi 6e or whatever the latest um, Wi-Fi is so it's like the yeah. fastest possible Wi-Fi right now and um, because it's built into the camera itself not a memory card it doesn't need that that addition it doesn't lose any of that transmit data for, that a memory card would give so you're getting the 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 absolute fastest it can possibly process um, through the Wi-Fi so if you're on a Wi-Fi 6 network you could potentially get almost a gigabyte speed of transfer um, crazy. through Wi-Fi right um, so yeah, it's, that's, that is, that is a beautiful thing. And just to touch on the whole, like, you know, wanting to add the, the Frederick special sauce after you shoot the photos is that's where Imagine com comes in, right? Like Imagine learns how you edit. So like you're getting it to your, to your smug mug gallery, but you're actually getting it edited the same way you would. <laughs> so yeah. that's the, that's the beautiful part. Um, but I, right. and I, so I haven't, I have one of the Fuji prototypes, um, the Fujifilm prototypes. I, I, oh, cool. I, nice. Um, I haven't fully tested it as far as can it, can I choose which photos go? Like, mm -hmm. but at the same time, like, do I want to choose which photos go? Because then I'm now I'm slowing myself back down again. You know what I mean? I like, want the choice. I want, I want to be able to ch make the choice of whether I yeah. want everything that every time I press the shutter, whatever you record, put yeah. that somewhere. Or I think what, what uh, iFi did back in the day, if I remember, it's coming back to me. Like on the Nike, I shoot Nikon. So on the Nikons, at least there was, uh, there's a lock button on there where you can you can actually right. lock an image. So yeah. they would you could set it so it would only send up the images that you locked, which right. was cool, right? Because you could be shooting, yeah. you're like, yeah, that one needs to go. Okay, no, this one needs to go. Or later when you're reviewing, you could pick and have those automatically yeah. go up. So something like I think it's not a it's it's not a one size fits all. It's got to be a situational type thing. But I, I the, the speed, you know that I think that's that's the part where I need to see this work. I need to tr I need yeah. to try it in person, on mm -hmm. on something that's mission critical to see where the holes are. Yeah. That's the only only time you'll see 
if it's well, actually viable, yeah. you know, to put it, I mean, put I it tell into you, at, battle. Yeah. At, at imaging and at WPPI, which doesn't have great Wi-Fi on the trade right. show floor and around the hotel, right? Any trade they, show. So, yeah. At, um, at imaging, I think they had about, I want to say like 15 prototypes around mm -hmm. the trade show. Mm -hmm. All people shooting all at once. And at WPPI, it was even more. It was probably over 20 prototypes all at once. Um, and they were constantly, constantly going and showing the, the results. Um, so well, even with yeah, the... You, you played, so you've played with it. It's a great person to ask this question to. So you've seen yeah. it in action. You've played with yeah. it. Um, you mentioned briefly earlier that, you know, your your phone, you don't, you don't need to phone. And I think you were saying right. that more from the standpoint of you don't need to pair and then copy from the, the camera to your phone. Mm -hmm. Correct. And then send it somewhere that way. But it is still using your phone, right? No. It's connecting dir directly. It, no, so it doesn't. So is there a, it goes... there's a cellular chip inside these Fuji cameras that... No, it's it... it's Wi-Fi. It's Wi-Fi. Also, oh, um, so there's there's a Wi-Fi chip inside it. So, yeah. Which means it needs to connect to the local Wi-Fi and Correct. send I... that way. So you're still kind of at the, the you know... You're you're under control of whatever Wi-Fi connection that you're connected Correct. to, but like right. you said, in the in the case of a trade show, everybody and their mama is connected to that Wi-Fi yeah. to the really so horrible Wi-Fi. Is it, yeah. and if it still worked in that situation, yeah, then I think we got something, right? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and keep okay. in mind, like if you're, um, let's let's go back to the NASCAR thing. You're shooting NASCAR. Yeah. Maybe you've got yourself a five G hotspot, and you it's yeah, only you, which I need. And yeah, I need to get and that. now you're good, right? Um, and yeah. I, I had to double check. I had the, I had the camera packed um, right now because I'm going to be using it next week. But I think I have to double check. I think it might have an Ethernet port as well. Um, but I have to double check. Oh, so, the, in the, the grip because it's a grip. Too. Oh, the camera itself is going to like. Uh, uh, oh, wow. I okay. think I think the grip might have it because the the one that um, they gave me has a has a grip attached. So I have three batteries at once for the camera. If that's true, um, double check that because if that's true. And You're you talking now. Plug, you have gigabit. <laughs> you, well, yeah. Well, you can plug, and especially if there's if they're doing uh, power over Ethernet as well. So if you can bring in an Ethernet cable and have your your camera charged at the same time, and you know, basically tethered, and whatever it yeah. shoots goes back, you basically have a remote camera at that True. point where you can True. set it up and just you know go to town yeah. wherever yeah. you happen to be, as long as you have that that connection. But yeah. Wi-Fi, uh, having, the Wi having the Wi-Fi connection, having the Wi-Fi connection is the, that's the, I guess that's the weak link, right? For now. Yeah. Right? So For you now. need to have, yeah. you need to have one of those pucks or whatever to give you that 5G wherever or a Starlink account or something, you know, yeah. so that, that you could shoot and share, but you still, you, you need, you know, it's not magic. It's not going to create something from nothing. So you need... Right. You need inner or Wi-Fi access in order to make this work, which I think yeah. more and more is becoming ubiquitous. A lot of today's cars yeah. have Wi-Fi built into them, right? Exactly, so, exactly. Yeah. The future, the future's it's here. So yeah, no, for sure. This was part one of my conversation with Frederick. I would love for you to tune into the second episode, part two of this conversation, which is also live right now in all the podcast players. So head right over to it. Check out part two right now. You have been listening to Workflows, presented by Imagine. To hear more from Workflows, to find links to our guests, and for an exclusive offer for Workflows listeners, please go to imagineai.com slash podcast. And be sure to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you for tuning in. Until next time.